Good evening. My name is Aram. Um, I work at NVIDIA. Over the last seven years, my pri primary responsibility was to help our customers and our partners to build systems and software to allow for very large scale training of neural networks. And once yourselves uh, finish that training to help deploy those trained neural networks to productions cost, cost effectively. And this is something that myself and Sergio, who will join me in on a stage in a couple of minutes, will focus on today. So I don't think it will be a shocking statement to say that even the smallest of large language models are large. Yes. How many of you remember the size of BERT large in terms of number of parameters? Here, go on. 340 million parameters. So even the smallest variant that we are talking about today has 2 billion parameters. That's, that's give or take six times larger. And that does matter. So a lot of you are right now building early POCs, early systems demonstrators, and you know how quickly that model executes does not seem to matter. It also might not matter how many dollars per million tokens are you spending. But at some point, um, that will become critical for the success of your application and your business case. And those models are large. They are large in many different ways. They consume a lot of memory. They consume a lot of memory bandwidth. And they can be computationally uh, demanding, especially when you have a more challenging application where you truly care about latency. Deployment of those models can be challenging. And let's look at a tangible example. Let's look at Gemma. A, 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 a neural network architecture like Gemma will consume about two gigabytes of memory for every billion parameters. And that, those are weights alone. This doesn't account for any temporary uh, memory allocation that you have to do in order to maintain activations in between layers. This doesn't account for the KV cache that you need to have in order not to recompute the same information over and over again. This also uh, means that uh, you need, especially for the larger variant, sizable uh, sizable amounts of memory and that memory also needs to be fast. You have to be delivering a large amounts of data to and from the GPU registers very quickly and it is critical that uh, you do it correctly and building the code that achieves that, that, uh, that passes memory back and forth cost effectively is difficult and we appreciate that. Uh, that is why over the last um, two years we've been focusing on development of libraries to help you overcome some of those challenges. Um, and we do appreciate that those things are important. The throughput of your neural networks directly translates on your margins. Yes, The latency of those neural networks truly matter for countless of applications. So let's look at some of the things we can do to make both those neural networks cheaper and faster at the same time. Fortunately, there exists a family of tools that can help you achieve those goals. And the, the tool that we've been working on over the last uh, two and a half, three years now um, uh, is called uh, TensorRT LLM. That tool gives you a number of features that will allow you to control both uh, the throughput of the neural network, which equates to cost, as well as latency. And as you can see on this graph, and this graph is actually uh, from Lama 7b, we'll look at Gemma specific numbers later on, those differences can be fairly dramatic. Um, Tensor RT LLM is an open source tool that you can download from Git repository today, and that will allow you to take uh, all of the open source models but also use uh, your own large language models or other transformer architectures and with a relatively easy uh, Python API, optimize them for, for, for production deployment. It provides you off the shelf a lot of capability that are truly difficult to implement yourself, such as a robust implementation of KV caching, in-flight batching, multi-GPU, multi-node deployment, uh, custom kernels for multi-head uh, multi at attention, quantization, uh, and many other features that are critical uh, for you to be able to execute those models cost effectively. And with that, let me pass on to Sergio, who will show you through the process of deploying those models to production. Thank you very much, Adam. 
Yeah, so I know that I'm the last speaker of the day, so I will try to be concise. And I just want to remind you of two messages, really important messages that Adam was mentioning just now. And the first one is that these optimizations are not trivial. So um, with TensorRTL LLM, we are implementing them out of the box for you. And the second thing is that it's really easy to use. And today I'm going to show you a demo that will display how easy it is to do this. I was running this demo, let me pass it here. I was running this demo a few days ago, late at night. Uh, so, you know, if I was able to do it back then, I'm sure you will also be able to reproduce it. So in this demo, I'm taking the Gemma models and I'm just uh, running the engines with TensorRTL LLM and also running the model. Here, I'm just showing the GitHub page that we have about uh, TensorRTL LLM, in which we have added documentation about Gemma. Here, we provide a lot of information of all the commands that you need to run. But honestly, these are just two lines of code, the ones that you need to run in order to gain the performance of all these optimizations that Adam was showing. This is my terminal. Welcome to my laptop. I'm using an H100 PCI card. And, you know, I've just set up a container with TensorRTL LLM installed in it. I have also downloaded the checkpoint, the Gemma checkpoint from Kaggle, the Torch version, and I'm showing here the directory of it. And the next step is just to run two commands. First one is run a command to unify the different checkpoint formats. We have a JAX format, we have a Torch format, and we have many others. So first step, we run this command. Release a command, we just provide the type of quantization, we just provide the input directory, output directory, and that's it. And this is going to convert the checkpoint into a safe tensor format. I'm running it now. This takes around two minutes, but I'm just speeding up the, the video here a bit. And once we have this safe tensor checkpoint, the next step is simply to run the tensor TLLM building uh, command. This is the command that I'm printing now in the terminal. It has several flags, and these flags correspond uh, to the different optimizations that TensorRTL LLM implements for you. You can see, for example, a flag related to quantization. With TensorRTL LLM, you can run, for example, FP8 out of the box with post-training uh, post quantization or even quantization aware training. We can also have activation aware quantization. So, you know, all these kind of tricks that uh, we can use to uh, squeeze the maximum performance out of our GPU. <laughs> now we are building the engine. There are quite a few logs that explain what, what the process is doing. And after just a few, I think around one minute, we have the engine ready with all those optimizations implemented into it. <laughs> the next step is just to run the engine. Um, here, just for simplicity, I'm running a ram.py script, which is, is really simple. It's just going to call the engine and perform inference. Here I'm just asking it, what is a GPU? <laughs> so I hope that Gemma knows how to reply to it. Yeah, I think, I think the output makes kind of sense. <laughs> so yeah, okay, you did a great job with Gemma. <laughs> so, so yeah, as you can see, it's really easy to build the TensorRTL LLM engines with Gemma, and it's also really easy to run it. But this is not the end of the journey. Once we have our engines, we really care about performance. As Adam was saying, we need to understand how to squeeze the maximum performance, and this means reducing latencies and maximizing th throughputs. This plot may be familiar to some of you. I'm just plotting the latency in the x-axis and the throughput in the y-axis. This is a classical optimization problem in latency and throughput because you cannot optimize for both. Either you are in the lower left corner, which is low latency, amazing, but high throughput, <laughs> sorry, but low throughput, or you are in the other corner, which is high latency, which is bad, but high throughput. What I want to show with these plots is that it's really important to take advantage of the latest um, generations of GPUs. You can see from the yellow line to the red one, the only change that we're using is the latest GPU moving from A100 to H100, and this improves a boost. This is moving the Pareto frontier, which means simply that for the same latency, you have more throughput. But also within the same 
hardware device, if you use the latest techniques in optimization, like FP8, you can push a bit more that frontier and gain even more throughput for the same latency. And that's what the blue bar displays. The other trick, fundamental trick, that TensorR TLLM provides is the capability to scale to multiple GPUs, even multiple nodes, seamlessly. Here I'm playing with a parameter called tensor parallelism that may be familiar to some of you. And this just means how we are going to partition our model to be run in more GPUs at the same time. We can see that playing with this parameter, we can, in some scenarios, obtain better latency and in others, better throughput. And this is also a fundamental parameter that, that I encourage you to play with at your own time. Finally, once we have our TensorR TLLM engines, it's really important to understand how we can deploy these engines in an efficient way. For that, I want to really stress the importance of a, a really strong inference server, such as the Triton inference server. This is an open source uh, inference server that allows you to take all the different requests from the clients, batch them efficiently, and then run the inference in these batches. This is also not a trivial piece of software, so we encourage you to use it and give it a try. And finally, once you have the inference server running, the next step is to have a microservice that is able to receive these requests from the clients through an API, for example, one of the popular APIs in the market, like the OpenAI API, and you as, you know, use it as, as a drop-in replacement to these APIs and run the inference instead, instead of, you know, in a remote server, you will be running it in your local server, but calling it with this microservice. So this is a really interesting piece of technology that we also encourage you to use. This is now in early access. And, you know, in our GTC conference in a few weeks, we will actually make it generally available. <laughs>